Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Sumo User Conference tutorial. My name is Jacob Erdmann, and I will present what I think is the 10th tutorial in the series. So enjoy. Um, the topics we'll be covering today are, as usual, something about OSM Web Wizard to get all of you started, especially the newer users. Uh, then we'll talk about how to look at strange things that might happen during the simulation. We'll get a deeper look at some of the pedestrian models included in Sumo, especially the new ones. And uh, for the final fun, we'll, looking at, we'll be looking at flying taxis. To follow the tutorial, you'll be needing the latest Sumo release, which is version 120. And uh, you may be needing uh, Python, and the data files are in the link, uh, behind the link. You can find it also in the tutorial section on the Sumo documentation pages. So, first of all, OSM Web Wizard. This is our tool to get you started with a Sumo simulation with, well, about three clicks. Um, it's a Python application that you can launch from your start menu if you've installed Sumo, or you can find it in the Sumo Tools folder. And upon launching it, it will open up a web browser and show your map. Basically, an open street map based rendering of the world. And there you can select an area, um, modes of traffic that you want to see in your simulation. And then when you click generate scenario, um, the data will be downloaded, processed, and Sumo GUI will open on your machine and you are ready to watch a simulation. So the things that you configure here are, as I mentioned, the location, um, it will then select uh, uh, the data, the corresponding data from the OpenStreetMap database and populate it with random traffic according to the selected traffic modes. So cars, trucks, buses, motorcycles, pedestrians, etc., etc. And uh, uh, you can also configure the road types that should be included in the simulation, um, such as uh, uh, with or without uh, rails, or only the roads, or only pedestrian stuff. And for each mode of traffic, you can select the, the traffic volume that you want to see, and also uh, how much traffic is generated at the borders of the network, or rather within the network. This is the, the fraction of through traffic, the through traffic factor. Um, you can also select whether you want to have public transport in your simulation, how, for how long the scenario will be running, which is basically for how long traffic should be inserted into the scenario. And you can also uh, configure it to include the, uh, the shapes of buildings uh, and points of interest for trees, post boxes, whatever is in OpenStreetMap. And then there's also a checkbox that lets you uh, switch on a satellite background instead of uh, the normal shapes. Now, um, all these files will be downloaded um, to your computer in a folder. Uh, if you downloaded the tutorial files, you can find such an example folder uh, named zero underscore wizard. But today, we want to look at the deeper implications of some of these checkboxes here. So let's go into more details. The through traffic factor. Um, this is useful. Um, uh, if you want to discriminate between smaller and larger networks. If you have a small network, then probably most of the traffic will be through traffic. So the traffic should start uh, at the network boundary and you will want to set a high through traffic factor value. Whereas if you have a larger network, then it's fair to say that lots of traffic will be starting and ending within the network. So the through traffic factor doesn't need to be so high. Then there's the count setting, which you can set for each mode. And it means vehicles per hour per road kilometer. So here in this case, where it's set to 12, if you had a network with just one kilometer uh, of roads for cars, then that would give you 12 cars within one hour, which is the default duration of the scenario, 3,600 seconds. Um, but there's more. If you enable specific modes, this will trigger additional processing of the network. So if you select 
the checkbox uh, the mo for the mode pedestrians, then the network will come with extra infrastructure. Uh, this will be sidewalks as well as pedestrian crossings. Otherwise, you won't have those. And there's one more thing. Um, for all the roads where OpenStreetMap doesn't uh, record the speed limit, which sometimes happens depending on your location in the world, uh, the default uh, will differ depending on whether you activated pedestrians or not. If you do, then an urban settings will be assumed and you'll have a default road speed limit of 50 kilometers per hour, which is tailored to Germany, uh, where you have a higher speed limit of 100 kilometers per hour outside urban settings, which is the default. Now, if you select the mode ship, then uh, also the rivers, canals, and ferry routes uh, 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 that are uh, known to OSM will be imported as part of the network. If you select bicycles, then extra bike lanes will be part of your generated network. Mm. Now, uh, apart from those traffic modes, there's also the checkbox uh, public transport. Uh, if you do that, then all the trains, buses, and ferries, which are in OSM uh, that uh, run through your network will be imported. And they will even get a synthetic schedule because schedules are not part of the of OSM. This has to be generated uh, by the, by the tool chain. And if you do, then the pedestrians may also use public transport. So without public transport, they all walk, but if you select public transport, then they can also ride one or more lines to reach their destination. If you set the checkbox car only here in the lower right corner, then it will only keep uh, edges for cars plus all the edges for public transport if you also activate a public transport. And now we're coming to one interesting setting. If you select satellite background, then, well, uh, there will uh, be satellite tiles downloaded from a server, and they will be put into your Sumo simulation, but uh, it will also change the geo projection of your network. Um, this has to do with uh, the standards that are typically used for satellite tiles. And the problem with that is, uh, this different projection uh, is not something that uh, 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 the geo people really like. It's a, it's a bad projection, plainly speaking, because it distorts distances. So in the worst case, uh, the roads may be uh, twice as long as they should be, or even worse. So really only do this if you know what you're doing and if you really need a satellite back. And then be prepared that you may have wrong distances in your network. And lastly, uh, the left hand traffic, uh, well, you should know when to check this. If, for example, you're in Great Britain, then you'll know that there are different right of way rules, uh, different from most of the rest of the world. So then check this box and you'll be fine. And then um, once all this has generated, you're looking uh, at a folder full of files. And they can be distinguished in basically two sets of data. First of all, stuff that is really needed by Sumo to run. So this is the Sumo configuration, which binds everything together. And it can be loaded uh, by Sumo GUI, by Sumo, and even by NetEdit. Then, of course, there is the traffic network. And there is uh, the traffic demand. There is a file for each mode that you selected. Uh, also, the traffic demand for the for the persons, uh, then there are the building shapes, and then there is a file that says how the initial view should be presented with regard to delay and color settings. And the second set of files are those that are needed if you want to rebuild the scenario with different options or different traffic. This is mainly the, the raw OSM data, the net convert configuration for rebuilding the network, the uh, configuration for poly convert to rebuild the shapes, and a batch file to regenerate all the traffic and the public transport. Now, let's look at the simulation. I'm launching uh, the Sumo configuration file, uh, which would also be launched if you press uh, generate scenario button. So, uh, when we press play, we can see uh, stuff moving, but everything is very small. So let's uh, maybe increase the size of the things. 
For this, I'm going to the view settings and I change the vehicles to be drawn with constant size. And to better appreciate what they're doing, I change the coloring to by speed. And now uh, let's look at this again. So you can see cars with different colors moving. What do the colors mean? Well, let's have a legend that tells us what the vehicle colors are. And so you can see uh, red cars are stationary, uh, yellow and green cars are driving at different speeds and the blue cars are the fastest here in the scenario. They're driving on a piece of motorway. So basically everything is looking good. We have cars moving, nothing out of the ordinary. If we look close, we can even see uh, some tram lines in this part of the network. So maybe wait for another tram to appear. And then I will zoom in to show you. We can also see some buses because they have slightly different shapes from the cars. So there are buses here in this part of the network. And at some point, we even have a tram running here. Actually two, that's fun. All right, so we have cars in the network. In the bottom, you can see 70 cars, but we also have persons, 290. So where are these? Let's change the settings to make the persons more prominent. So I'll make the vehicle small again, and now I'll increase the size of the persons. And I'll also change their coloring to better show what they're doing. So let's color them by the mode. Now we have persons in the network. You can see them moving on these roads in different colors. Let's zoom in. And so what do these colors mean again? Um, yellow means they're waiting for a ride. So you see they're waiting here at a bus stop, waiting for the bus to come. And green is walking and blue is riding. So let's zoom out. We have some blue persons here riding the bus. And of course, we have plenty of per green persons walking through the network. And there's the light blue. Those are using an access structure to get to a bus stop, maybe crossing the street or using some stairs to get to, to a rail stop. So we have the persons in the network. Now, the next thing we want to do with this is we want to look at some oddities. Uh, first of all, let's just look at warning thrown up by the simulation. The first warning we saw down here in, in the Sumo GUI uh, was regarding the length of a bus stop. Now, uh, you can click on the underlined words in the warning and it will take you to the location, either to the stop or to the lane. And you can even click to jump to the vehicle if it's still in the area. Now, uh, the warning is the bus stop is too short for a vehicle. And as you can see here, it's really a very short piece of bus stop. Uh, if we want to know how long exactly, we can see that it's just a length of five meters, starting at position zero, going to position five. Uh, and so this is enough to fit a normal car, but not a bus. Um, well, in what happened here, in reality, the bus stop would uh, cover this part, um, but uh, there is an intersection here in the simulation where a side road enters, it's just a small side road, but the simulation considers all of this an intersection, and it is currently not possible to place bus stops on an intersection. So the, for this reason, the bus stop has been artificially shortened in SUMO, uh, which uh, was causing this warning. Now, do you need to be worried about this? No, unless you have multiple buses that want to use a stop at the same time, it's really no problem. The bus will stop here and uh, persons can, be, uh, can enter and leave it just fine, even with the shorter length. So basically this is a known issue and working as expected. Let's uh, run the simulation some more and uh, get more warnings maybe. Uh, to speed up the simulation, I can lower the delay value here. And so then it's over real quick. And indeed, we have some more warnings that we can look at. So the person is jammed on some edge. Um, so we can 
again click on the underlined uh, location, the edge ID, and see where that is. But now it would be nice to also see the situation while it develops. So I'm clicking on the time, which is also a link. Here it says a breakpoint has been set, uh, and the time is five seconds ahead of that time. This is a convenient feature. You can actually set uh, the, the time difference in the menu. So it's set to minus five seconds when you click on a timestamp. And now we can just reload the simulation and rerun it to that time. So it will automatically stop at the time of the breakpoint. If you want to see or edit breakpoints, you can also do this from the breakpoint menu, accessible by Control B, the breakpoint editor. All right. So now we have this situation which uh, uh, will in five seconds lead to this warning. So I'm going to single step the simulation, which you can do with the D key or by pressing this step button. And now there's our warning. This is the, uh, the pedestrian and it's jammed with regard probably to this vehicle. And it looks pretty weird because apparently the uh, pedestrian is walking on the road. So what is going on here? First of all, I'll try to visualize for you which way the pedestrian wants to walk. So I right click and select walking area path. And you can see this is the way the pedestrian would like to walk within the intersection. Um, but then you can see already some strange shapes. And I will make this uh, strange shape more, uh, more obvious to you by highlighting it. So the person is on a walking area, which is uh, an area within the intersection. Uh, but when I right click here, um, I have to select this one. All right. So this is a walking area and I'm marking it here. I'm adding it to the set of selected objects. And this allows me uh, to uh, show it more prominently in the visuals by changing the edge coloring to by selection. Uh, and I think I picked the wrong one. So let's uh, remove this from the selected set and try again. Yeah, all right. So uh, now in this part, when I right click, I only get the junction. To get all the objects that are in the same place, I hold down the Alt key and then do a right click again. So this is the one area I want to select. And now we can better see that it has a very strange shape. It has this uh, little triangle here and then another triangle there. And if we want to see all of this and nothing else, there's a neat trick you can do. Simply uh, make everything that is not selected transparent and also hide the junction shape. And now you can see this is the shape of the walking area uh, something bad happened here during network generation. And so the best way here is uh, if we want to get rid of this warning is really to fix the network. And I'll show you how to do this in the next step. So um, let's look at that uh, intersection in NetEdit. Uh, for this, I can launch uh, the network editor directly on, on the spot. And as you can see, uh, this intersection is really a cluster of multiple junctions. Uh, and uh, this is something that comes out of OSM and is generally not very good for micro simulation, having such a cluster of things. Um, the automatic network, convert, uh, network conversion tries its best to, to, to uh, join these clusters, but sometimes you have to do this manually. So. I'm switching to the selection mode, this button or the S key. You can see it down here, which keys are pressed. Then I left click on all the uh, parts of this junction cluster, and then I join them into a single junction. This is the join selected junction function, F7. And now there's only a single point here, and I want to see the geometry. This is the a five key compute junctions, and there we have it. Uh, now this has a much better shape. 
we don't see any strange triangles. Uh, however, uh, in, the, in the process of uh, uh, fixing this junction, we lost the pedestrian crossing. So let's restore this as well. There's another mode for this, it's the crossing mode. So I can press the R key to go to the crossing mode. Then I click on the junction where I want to add a pedestrian crossing. And then I click on all the network edges that should be crossed until they're all bright green. And then I create crossing or I press the enter key, which has the same effect. And now the network is fixed. So um, are we done yet? Not quite, uh, because we changed the edges in the network as well. So we have to rebuild the traffic. So you just run the build batch file. That's what it's for. But while you do, make sure that Sumo GUI has been closed on Windows, because otherwise it will prevent you from overriding the files. Now, um, we are at the next step. We've changed the network. And now we, when we run the simulation in this place, we can see that the geometry looks much better. And we can see that no pedestrian jamming occurs anymore in that section of the network. All right, moving on. More oddities. So we find that at the end of the scenario, there are lots of warnings about pedestrians that missed their bus. So basically, they aborted waiting at a bus stop at the end of the scenario. Um, this, is a, this abortion is a convenience feature. The simulation noticed that no bus will come anymore. There are only waiting persons. And so it makes sense to terminate the simulation automatically. But of course, there is then a warning. Now, let's find out why these persons missed their bus. And first of all, let's have a look at the input files. So we pick the first person. It's called PED774. And we'll find it in the input file. This is a part of the scenario, osmpedestrians.route.xml. And I've already extracted the relevant uh, lines of uh, XML code um, that describe what this person is doing. So um, at this point in time, the person enters the scenario. Then it walks to a bus stop. So here it starts with a walk that ends at the bus stop. And then it wants to ride to some other bus stop using this line, 160 column zero. And it uh, even knows which bus uh, the person wants to take, uh, the, the fifth one of a series of buses, which is departing at this time. So that's the plan. And then finally, uh, after reaching the, the second bus stop, it should walk again to its destination. But somehow this doesn't work. The person uh, keeps waiting there at the bus stop at this one, uh, and the bus uh, isn't coming. So uh, to, to figure this out, uh, we basically have two strategies. Uh, one is to, to look at output data that uh, is generated by the simulation. And the second strategy is looking at uh, the UI, at Sumo GUI. And we'll, of course, we'll do both so to see how they reinforce each other. So for the data-driven analysis, we'll run the simulation uh, with an option to generate output. This looks about like this. If you have a command line window, this is Sumo minus C, which uh, is the option for configuration file. And of course, we need a file name for this. And that's it. So now, after this is done, we have a new file in this folder. It's the trip info output. Um, this is what it looks like. It's another XML file which holds information about all the cars and all the persons in the simulation and gives a summary of what they did. So I've copied this out here for you to the slides. And uh, we can see uh, the different stages of what the person did. It was walking, then uh, it was accessing a bus stop. This is automatically generated. 
So you didn't find this in the input. Then there's a ride and then the final walk. But here we can already see the vehicle is null. So there is no proper vehicle and the time of departure has an error value. The minus one, that's an error value. And also the arrival has an error value. So the ride did not start and it also did not arrive. And subsequently the walk uh, also didn't depart or arrive. So, um, but we can see the time at which the person reached the stop. And the time is, uh, the arrival at the stop is 3201, uh, whereas the departure of the bus was 3156. So the bus was missed by roughly 45 seconds. Don't you hate it when that happens? Um, so why, why did it happen? Well, there's uh, the key information here, the speed factor and the time loss. The speed factor here means that the person uh, was walking slower than average. Every person gets assigned a factor, a random factor centered at one with a standard deviation of uh, 0 0.1. Um, and this describes uh, the, the the walking speed, the maximum walking speed of the person. So they don't all, all walk at the same speed. So this one was a slow person. And secondly, um, there's the time loss. So a person uh, that walks slower than its desired speed uh, loses time relative to its expectation. And so this person was walking even slower. Um, and the reason why that happens is that there's uh, Additionally, to this random speed factor, some random slowdowns during walking. So a person that walks doesn't walk with constant speed, but rather there is some variation in the walking speed, which is controlled by a sumo option. And basically this means that the person walks only with 90% uh, of, uh, of, the, of the maximum speed on average. And though this causes uh, the loss of 71 seconds and overall, uh, missing the bus. So that's uh, we what we can get from the data. But let's also uh, do a visual analysis and see uh, how this looks in Sumogui. So we know uh, that the person departs at time 2519. So let's track this in the simulation. I'll set a breakpoint to the time of the departure. We'll run the simulation and forward it to that time. So that was the space key which toggles running and stopping. Uh, you can be, remind yourself of these hotkeys in all the menus. And now I want to go to the point where that person started. So I'll find it. Pedestrian. And one thing we can do is uh, track its speed. For this, I do a right click on the person and then show parameter. Um, actually, I think I got the wrong person here because we're in the, let's see. Yeah. This one. show parameter here, you can see the speed factor that we already talked about. And now when I do a left click on this icon, I'll get a plot of the speeds over time. So let's arrange the windows a bit. So we can follow the speeds. And another thing we can do is we can track the person. Tracking. And let's see. So the person is walking happily along the road. And then there is this little access stage 
following this thin line and the burden is at the bus stop, unfortunately too late. And here you can see the walking speed. You can see that it varies over time. Uh, and this comes out to about 90% uh, of the walking speed. So at least this showed you how to find a person, track a person and plot its properties. Uh, it still missed the bus. So how do we fix this? Well, there are several approaches. Um, we could have uh, done better planning and just assume that uh, the persons will be slower when they walk. So there's a default assumption of persons walking with 75% speed, but we can reduce this in the, in the traffic generation and then uh, uh, all the, the, the timings will be, uh, well, well, they have more reserves. Uh, another option to do is we can plan the intermodal routes so which bus to take within the simulation rather than beforehand. And this gives us the knowledge of how fast a person actually is. So do, are we taught is a fast or a slow person planning their route? And the final solution is we can just send more buses. Um, so how does that come out? For the different mitigations, which you can all uh, find here uh, in the tutorial files, in the catch bus folder, uh, well, if we, if we generally plan with slower walking speeds, then this specific person catches the bus, other persons still miss it. Um, if we plan uh, the routing, the intermodal routing in the simulation, then uh, even more persons manage to catch the bus. There are still two misses. Um, and if we do the, the final mitigation attempt, then uh, well, if we, as long as we send enough buses, then everybody uh, can catch one because, well, eventually there will be a next bus. All right, for uh, the final oddity, this is one that didn't generate an error, but it's something that uh, uh, that may uh, have you wondering nevertheless. So we specified a scenario with a traffic demand for one hour but the simulation ended uh, more than two hours uh, after the first person entered. So this is something that you can see in the, in the final line of the simulation. Here, simulation ended at time. This is it. So what, what took so long? Again, we can do a data-driven analysis. We can just look in the trip info output and see what the last arrivals were, um, or we can use Sumo GUI to see who's still uh, active in the simulation before it ends. So this is not something we can see in the final picture because there everybody has been removed. But if we set a breakpoint to uh, almost the simulation end, let's say time 7835, rerun it, then we can see persons that are still walking. So let's find these persons. And we don't want the blue one, so let's make them even more visible. We can make everything bigger. Ah, and I would have to color them according to their mode. And then we have this, uh, uh, these, uh, this green person, which is walking. And we can figure out uh, where it's walking. And we can see it's walking all over the network. Um, Let's play with the exaggeration a bit to make this more visible. Uh, let's see. So you can see this is a snaking path through the network. Uh, so it's a very, very long walk that was actually causing the problem. And uh, if we look closer, 
we find that uh, there are some artifacts uh, in the network that cause this long walk. So, of course, the network is only a small part of a, of a larger city of Berlin. And where we cut the network, we, we cut some connectivity. So actually, the person has to do a detour to, uh, to walk around these missing edges. And this occurs in, in, in two locations. And if we look uh, even closer, we can even spot a small connectivity problem where a pedestrian crossing is missing. So um, just looking at these oddities uh, teaches you a lot about uh, your scenario and about things that you may want to change. For example, picking a, a, better, um, a better bounding box for what you want to simulate. Now, um, going to the next step of the tutorial, I want to show you some pedestrian models. Mm. So, because we did talk about persons and persons that walk around the network, now the question is what, how do they actually walk? Well, Sumo does provide different uh, models for walking persons, but first of all, let's describe uh, the scenario that we want to look at. It's a spring sale at the hardware store. Um, everybody wants to buy gardening supplies, so we have um, a hardware store here, and we have an entrance here, and then a big parking lot that everybody has to walk across. Of course, we are very environmentally friendly. Everybody is taking the bus to buy their stuff at the hardware store, and so they have to walk all this, uh, walk all across this parking area. Mm. So to set this up in NetEdit, mm. Uh, we'll have to define a flow of persons. And uh, here's how this goes. So I'm launching NetEdit here and opening the network. And well, to to have you see some uh, some background, I'm also loading the shapes here. Um, this would be Here's the hardware store and the parking. So what do we do? Um, NetEdit has uh, three major modes, one for network editing, one for traffic demand editing, and one for data editing. Now that we want to define a person flow, we go to the demand mode, which is the F3 key. Then we go to the person mode, P, and then we define a person flow. So demand and person mode. And uh, the hotkeys are always in the menu. So P would be the person mode. And now we select not only a single person, but rather a person flow. And we click on the origin edge. Let's use this one. And the destination edge, that's, that's this one. And we define uh, the kind of flow we want. Let's have it not evenly spaced, but uh, with a Poisson distribution, which is this. And uh, then I press finish route creation or I hit the enter key. And here's the person flow. Uh, and of course, we can do the same thing in reverse order and we'll have another person flow. Um, so let's look at the file that, we, that was generated for this, um, when, we, when we save this to a file, we have two person flows. This is how they look like. Now, um, let's look at the first uh, pedestrian model. It's the default model and it's called the striping model because it divides uh, sidewalks and other spaces for walking into some well, stripes and has the person walking there in parallel. So this is the first Sumo configuration. 
and let's see them go. So you can see the persons are walking here in both directions. The coloring is according to the angle, but oh no, there's a big jam. Uh, and well, this does resolve itself at some time, uh, but it's really a mess. So this, uh, to put it uh, bluntly, this uh, model, um, it has uh, problems if there are lots of persons uh, in very small space. So uh, it's good for pedestrian crossings and sidewalks, but uh, maybe not so good if everybody wants to uh, walk here across this path. What can we do? Maybe it doesn't make sense that everybody follows the same path. So maybe they should spread out over the parking lot. That would make more sense. So we can set an option in Sumo that uh, lets the persons randomize their path over the parking lot. Uh, and let's see how that looks. So again, we have our persons walking, um, but to better appreciate where they walk, I'll make them bigger again. And now, as you can see, they're spreading out. And also, uh, they're not jamming here uh, in this area so quickly. So much better. Uh, Unfortunately, there's still so much traffic and they all have to uh, be near these locations. Even if they can spread out in between, uh, many have to pass this way. And so there's another jam after 25 minutes of simulation. Okay, but uh, that's not the end of it. Um, we can make the pedestrians a bit smarter here, have them always reserve part of uh, of their ways for, for the oncoming traffic. And so we can set this uh, sumo option uh, for reserving a bit of uh, space. And if we look at this, finally, then there is no jam. So they're just a bit. Uh, more cautious and making use of the space. So if, if you have a typical scenario with not so much pedestrian traffic, you don't need this option, but for scenarios like this, it's helpful to set it. Um, just be aware that it's still not a guarantee against uh, any kind of jamming. And so if you run this simulation multiple times with different random seats, then the simulation will be held behave slightly different in each run, and some of these runs may see jump. But here, we can see this finished without any jump. And the pedestrians, well, you saw them walk, uh, pretty straightforward. Um, maybe let's have it one more time. Really look at the details of how they walk. So they're spreading over the space. They are avoiding each other. But uh, one thing to note here is that they're always walking forward. They're never going backwards, even to avoid each other. They may move sideways, but never backwards. So let's look at another model. A new one. It's the UPETSA model that was recently added to Sumo. And uh, we can see this in the third, third configuration. To activate this model, we need to set this option, pedestrian model UPETSA. And this is what it looks like. First of all, you notice that uh, all the space that's fit for walking uh, has an extra color just to make it more visible that there's UPETSA running here but you can disable this in the person settings, show you pets and network, just disable the, the checkbox. And also let's make the persons a bit bigger. 
So you see how they work. So again, this is with them all uh, having the same uh, path, no randomization here. It looks pretty smooth and they don't jam. What you may also notice is that it's running a bit slower because I'm not setting any delay here, uh, but it's still uh, easy to follow them. Follow them. All right. Of course, uh, we can also, um, no, let's discuss the speed actually. So first of all, the speed depends on the total network size, at least for the current version of your Petson. So it's better to not have the large network here, but rather cut out a smaller part. Uh, we recently learned uh, uh, one of the reasons for the slowdown, so it may go away in the future, but uh, here we still have an advantage of having only a small network, just as big as is needed. And even then, uh, it's about, um, uh, well, um, whereas, whereas uh, the, the striping model runs at about 6,000 times real time, this model here is, uh, is running at 10 times real time. So, um, yeah, a, a different a factor of 600 between the two models. Unfortunately, there's another disadvantage to the model, is, and this is that it's not yet interacting with cars or traffic lights. So it's for pure pedestrian simulation, su uh, suitable at the moment, but we are planning to change this and to also add the interaction. And now, for the last bit, uh, for a bit of fun, if we uh, also do the route randomization, so we spread out uh, the persons over the whole parking lot, then uh, we can uh, see some more interesting interactions at uh, a corner here. So now forwarding to an interesting situation at uh, 10 minutes. Wait for it, and now, if you look closely, you can see that the persons are really interacting with each other. They're sometimes walking backwards, they're doing a little dance. Uh, so you see, it's really a different model in there. It's not the striping model anymore. And of course, they're evading each other. All right, uh, are we done with the models? Not yet. There's yet one more model at Sumo. It's called the non-interacting model. And so it's really, really fast, even 10 times faster than striping. Uh, in this model, the pedestrians jump over junctions and they don't interact with anything. And of course, it doesn't jam. So when would you want to do this? Well, mainly if you're interested in something like public transport and you want to have uh, those different uh, riding stages connected with some rough estimate of walking time, so if you're not interested in the walking itself, but only at the, all the other things a person is doing, then you can use the non-interacting model to speed things up. So that was it for pedestrian models. Moving on to the next topic, uh, flying taxis. So as we discussed before, the scenario uh, uh, has several obstructions um, caused by the cutting of the network, but also by there being a canal in, in the middle and a motorway, so uh, many pedestrians have to walk, uh, have to take long detours to de reach their destination. Well, in such a situation uh, with these long detours, we have an ideal testbed for future mobility, so the flying taxis, which can just uh, go over the obstacle and have a fast and efficient routes to the destination. So I will take you through all the steps needed to have a simulation of flying taxis. Mm. Now, um, for the first step, um, there is a, there's a small complication that we have to take because at the moment, um, the, the taxis in Zumo, they really need to use the, the taxi vehicle class. They can't yet uh, be aircraft. So the first thing we have to do is to remove 
the taxi permissions from all the roads because we want our taxis to fly. We don't want them driving on the roads. So we want, first of all, we want a network where the taxis, taxis cannot drive. For this, there's a small uh, Python script. It's called patchvclasses.py, and uh, there's uh, even a batch file in the in the tutorial folder in the flying in the flying taxi folder for you to run. It's the uh, buildnet batch file. Mm. And the next thing we do is uh, we use netedit to define takeoff and landing zones in the network. So let's do this. Let's load uh, the network. Um, All right, so I've picked a few spots, three in total, and this is how these landing zones look. They're basically uh, disconnected edges that allow only taxi. So if you want to create such an edge, you can go to the create edge mode, um, and then you set the permissions. So in this case, first disallow everything, and then just allow the taxi where we have it here. And then we can create an edge and that's it. And maybe we want to change also the width of the edge. So the default width is, uh, um, well, actually it's 3.2 meters. And here I set this to six meters. So, uh, so we have now, let's uh, make this more visible. Let's find all the edges in the network that allow a taxi. Uh, three edges in all overall. And to make them stand out, we can use this visual scaling thing. And you can see here they are. Those are well distributed uh, flying, landing and takeoff zones for our Arial taxis. Um, next step. We have to define uh, the stops. Well, we would like to call them air stop, but we don't have that in Sumo, so it's a bus stop basically of for an Airbus, a flying bus. Um, so we place a bus stop on on each of these edges. Um, this can be done here in the additional mode, bus stop, click, and then we have to connected to the pedestrian network by defining an access element. So we we'll first click on the bus stop and then on the sidewalk, and this is our access. And we do this for all the, the, the landing and takeoff edges. And then save the bus stops to a farm. Mm. And now the third thing we want to do, the, there is no, no flying mode yet in Sumo, so we will create uh, plain edges that connect uh, uh, each point, uh, well, each, each landing and takeoff edge with each other uh, of these edges. And there's also a Python script for that to, to building a fully connected graph between particular edges. And uh, this is um, another uh, uh, batch file in the folder. Uh, actually, it's buildnet2, which runs the build full graph. So it's build net two. All right, this is the third step. For the fourth step, we define uh, the taxis, well, the, the flying taxis that run through the network. This is the, uh, again, the demand mode, and we define vehicles. Well, first of all, we define a new uh, vehicle type. So, we create, uh, we create a new type here, and we change the attribute. So let's have this be a taxi, but let's have it at least look like an aircraft. Uh, there. And maybe we want to 
uh, a better fit the width to that of an aircraft. Let's see which values did I want? The length and width six meters. It's a small. All right. And now we have our taxi type, and we can create the vehicle of that type. And we place it here. Notice that uh, all the edges that permit this taxi to drive are green, and all the ones that don't permit it are in cyan, because there's a conflict. So I place this here, press enter, and there we have it. And of course, uh, I can do this multiple times if I want to have multiple aircraft in the network. So, uh, now, the fifth step. Mm, we want all the persons to be able to make use of the new taxi mode. Uh, so far, they can only walk and use public transport, but taxi is something else because it doesn't run on a schedule. So we have to change the, the file that generates the traffic demand, the build batch file. Uh, and I've highlighted here all the changes that we do. In the, in, the mo in the attributes for the persons, we add the mode taxi. And in the additional files that are being loaded, we add the, the bus stops, or air stops, that we save to a file. And then we need to set two more options that define where people can enter and leave a taxi. And so we set this to the value of PT stops, which means all public transport stops, like bus stops. Uh, and of course, we need to uh, also adapt the network name because uh, after we, when we patched the network, we gave it a new name. All right, and then we can generate the, the, the new uh, pedestrian demand. Uh, let's... Uh, uh, see how that looks like after running the batch file. Um, no, that's the wrong one. Oops, and pedestrians. And as we can see, there are some persons now that want to walk and then ride with a taxi. So let's have a look at the simulation. And best of all, make the, make the person speak and make the vehicle speak as well. So you can see first air taxi here. You can see persons that are being picked up and flown to the destination. We And they fly around. Well, are we happy? Not quite. Once the simulation finishes, uh, first of all, we see that there's actually jamming. Um, look at this jam. But the most important thing we see is that at the end of the simulation, there are lots of persons that aborted waiting for the taxi at some stop. Um, so um, what is the reason for this? Let's discuss this. Um, uh, in, the, in the setting we now used, um, each taxi only transported one passenger and there was just not enough transport capacity. This means um, many uh, passengers had to abort their flight at the end of the simulation, had to abort their, their, their wait, well, their wait for a flight. So what can we do? We can allow ride pooling. So let's have at least uh, four persons per taxi. And the way to do this uh, is either by defining for individual persons a group, and everybody who's in the same group may use, uh, may share a taxi, uh, but we can simply set a default group for all the persons. So they're all in the same group and they can all do ride sharing. And if we do this, uh, it runs much nicer. We have only 12 people that uh, uh, couldn't get on, on their flight. Uh, so it's a lot more efficient. Um, but there is something else we can do. Mm. 
because the default uh, uh, dispatch algorithm for the taxis, it tries to be very fair. Uh, it tries to service the persons in the order in which they arrived at the stop. So uh, first come, first serve. Um, uh, and this may lead to, to wasteful flights because uh, 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 an airplane may uh, take off empty to get to another person that came first. So we can change the dispatch algorithm to the one that's called greedy closest. And this is more efficient on, 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 the, on the taxi resource because it lets every, uh, every taxi pick up the, the closest person. And if we do this, then um, almost everybody catches their flight. And on top of that, the service is so much more efficient uh, that the, the average waiting time for a flight goes down by three minutes. So you can see uh, there is a number of things you can do to have an efficient taxi service. Uh, we can also get this from the outputs. Um, if the simulation writes trip info files, then we can do use this uh, tool that comes with Sumo, the attribute stats tool, uh, which tells us how the travel times are distributed for persons. And so we can see that uh, not only is the average overall travel time going down, but also the maximum travel time goes down because all the persons that would have taken a long walk can now take a quick flight. And uh, um, also, uh, we can get a little plot. There's another Python tool that comes with Sumo uh, that uh, makes these plots out of the output files. If you want to look how that works, there's a batch file in the tutorial folder uh, that calls this tool. And here we can see uh, on the on the x-axis the travel time and on the y-axis uh, the count. So how often did which travel time occur? And we see that uh, the version without uh, taxis had uh, plenty of high travel times, uh, whereas the one with the taxis uh, has more of those uh, medium-sized travel times. And this is the reason why why the maximum and the mean values have improved with the taxi with the flying taxi simulation. So in conclusion, uh, flying taxis are great if you can get them. Um, and uh, I uh, wish you uh, a lot of fun with, uh, and success with using the Sumo tools to uh, develop your simulations. Uh, make sure to read the documentation before you ask any questions. But if you have questions or if you find any bugs, then report them at this address or open up an issue on GitHub and talk to us. We're always looking for project partners. Thanks.